Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 458th episode, we're talking about dinosaur feathers. It's a continuation of our mini season Beyond Bones. And so the soft tissue for this episode is feathers. We're going to be talking about their colors, how they molted, and even what ate them. And in addition to that, we're going to be talking about dinosaur of the day, Caudipteryx, which is famous for its feathers. Sure is. And in case you missed it, you can check out last episode, which was the first episode of Beyond Bones, where we talked about dinosaur soft tissues overall and, you know, what they are and how paleontologists have been able to study them, especially more recently including feathers. Mm -hmm. And we also have a fun fact, which is really amazing. It's about another example of a mammal fighting a dinosaur, which are so rare in the fossil record. So definitely stay tuned for that. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week we have a new patron to thank, and that's Scott. Thank you very much for joining our Dino-It-All community. And then rounding out our shout outs, we've got Dino Mo, Karen, Taylor, Ayumi, Sarasaurus Rex, Lazy Dump Truck, Ian, and James Pasco. Thank you so much for joining our community and being a dino it all with us. We appreciate your support, and it's because of our patrons and our listeners that we can do cool stuff like Beyond Bones. Yeah, yeah, there was a fair amount of extra research required since when you get into soft tissues, it's not our normal wheelhouse. Yes. <laughs> so like this episode, I'm talking about lice a little bit. Ooh. And I didn't really know anything about lice, but now I know a lot about lice. So I can <laughs> talk confidently about it on the show. <laughs> so without further ado, we're going to jump into our episode about dinosaur feathers. And I'm going to start out by explaining how we know dinosaurs had feathers at all. Because we didn't know until recently. Well, we kind of we did. We kind of did with Archaeopteryx. Yeah. So, yeah, the first dinosaur feather ever found was Archaeopteryx. In fact, it was the origin of the name Archaeopteryx, which means ancient wing or ancient feather. And it was named based on a single isolated feather found and described in 1861. It might have been found in 1860, but very close to the earliest days of dinosaurs. We already had a feathered dinosaur. Mm -hmm. That also means that the holotype of Archaeopteryx was purely soft tissue, which is pretty interesting. Oh, good point. (laughs) I never thought of it that way before. Yeah. All those years ago. The original feather basically looks like a detailed but faded painting of a feather is how I would describe it. You can clearly see the rigid rachis which is the part you write with if you're using a quill pen, you know, the middle stiff part. And there are really fine details of individual filaments of the feather branching off of the rachis. So it it looks really nice. It's Mm -hmm. like like an elegant painting, very precise. (laughs) It's also clearly asymmetrical, meaning the rachis is more to one side than the other. So asymmetrical feathers have been considered a requirement for flight, which is a big oversimplification. We talk a lot about it in our 390th episode, how dinosaurs evolved flight. But basically, with shorter feather filaments on one side of the rachis, those filaments deform less from the wind, which makes them better at flying. But it's not a definite requirement. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the original Archaeopteryx feather is made out of, We can tell it's a thin film by looking at it, but it could be made out of several different materials. One possibility is it's partially decayed and preserved organic material. That's the story for most fossil feathers that we've tested. It could also be a natural cast replica of the feather. So basically, if the feather got buried in sediment and then the feather decayed and left an empty space, a mineral-rich water could come in and fill the space, basically leaving behind a natural cast replica. Mm, One of the many ways that something could fossilize. Yes. So that's like how opalized fossils, for one of many examples, form. So it doesn't actually have any of the original material in that case, but it is still considered a fossil because it's still fossilized remains in a way. Mm -hmm. In order to figure out if it's organic material or something else, we'd need to do destructive testing, 
which would mean cutting a small piece out of that feather to analyze it. And curators have been justifiably resistant to that idea. Yes. <laughs> Although we often talk about histology on this show. Yes. So it would be like histology. It would be a destructive test. But this is such an important feather. We have lots of other feathers that can be tested. And there isn't necessarily that much value. Like mm -hmm. whether or not it's the original organic material or it's something that filled in its place doesn't really matter and the nice thing about it is looking at it and seeing the details of the feather itself so why would you want to mess it up yeah we don't have to find feathers to know that dinosaurs had them though big feathers are often connected directly to the bone with what are called quill knobs it's pretty crazy to me like imagining if we had hair mm -hmm. that like went down and like directly connected to bone <laughs> it's so <laughs> intense because you know they get hit right you know mm -hmm. so it's, it's yeah anyway <laughs> They need that firm attachment. So we can see quill knobs on some dinosaurs like Velociraptor, and then we can infer from the fact that it has quill knobs that the dinosaurs had feathers, because mm -hmm. why else would they have quill knobs if there wasn't a quill attached to the knob? Just for fun? Yeah. <laughs> Since that first feather was named Archaeopteryx, we found a lot of other dinosaurs with preserved feathers. It took until 1863, two years after the first Archaeopteryx feather, before any bones were assigned to Archaeopteryx. That was the London specimen, which is now considered to be the holotype. But now we have about a dozen Archaeopteryx specimens, many with a thin film of feather remnants around them. We've seen a lot of those specimens, or at least casts of those specimens, because mm -hmm. we managed to catch a traveling exhibit of them. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. I saw the London specimen in London, and I'm sure you have at some point. Mm -hmm. It's very pretty. It's not as pretty as the Berlin specimen. That's the one that most people get the most excited about. That's the one people usually have tattooed. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of examples of Archaeopteryx with feathers. But way more so than Archaeopteryx, now there are tons of dinosaurs found with feathers, especially in China. It took over a century in between Archaeopteryx and when we started finding all these in China. But it's really amazing what's going on in the fossil record in China and the paleontology over there right now. Yes. So there are some small dinosaurs, like hundreds of Microraptor, Anchiornis, and Cynoceropteryx, which are within the range of modern flying birds, within the size range, I should say. Mm -hmm. But there are also much larger dinosaurs with preserved feathers or simple proto-feathers. For example, Euteranus, which approached 30 feet or 9 meters long and weighed well over a ton, was covered in feathers. Yeah, that's one of my favorite examples because it was so large. Yeah. And it showed us that even large dinosaurs could be covered in feathers. Yeah, it's definitely the biggest example of a feathered dinosaur that we have so far. And it's cool because it's it's like a close relative of T-Rex. So mm -hmm. then everybody starts thinking like, well, the T-Rex have feathers? And the short answer is, we don't know. But... Probably not. As a juvenile, maybe it was fuzzy. Yes, maybe as a juvenile. That's true. Because animals, or I should say birds, as they grow up, a lot of them have different feathers when they're young versus old. So that's sort of the gist of how we know that dinosaurs have feathers. But we also have some news stories about dinosaur feathers. First, we have an update on Wulong. Wulong is from a paper written by Angus Crodace and others, and published in Acta Paleontologica Polonica. Wulong is a close relative of Microraptor. Wulong is a dromaeosaurid, aka a raptor, as you could guess that it's related to Microraptor. Sure. Because Microraptor is a raptor, whereas Megaraptor is not a raptor. <laughs> <laughs> Just to throw in a random confusing statement. So Wulong is from the early Cretaceous, about 120 million years ago. The name Wulong means dancing dragon. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah, that's because of its, quote, sprightly pose and inferred nimble habits. We talked about this one when it was first described back in 2020, but I figured to do a quick overview. The holotype is a one-year-old individual, and at that age, it's already bigger than Microraptor. Good thing it doesn't have micro in its name then. <laughs> yeah, that's true. By my rough measurements, which were very rough, because it's based on sort of a drawing of the skeleton with a scale bar. It's somewhere around four to five feet long or one to one and a half meters. That's about twice as long as Microraptor, hmm. if I did my measurements right. But the reason we're talking about it isn't because it's bigger than Microraptor and it's got a cool name. 
It's because it has a really well-preserved set of feathers. Yeah, this is a feather episode. (laughs) It is. So there are feathers around its arms, hands, legs, body, and it has a spectacular pair of feathers sticking off the end of its tail. So feathers everywhere, and they're all well-preserved. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. The fossil bones, when you look at the skeleton, because it's one of those kind of like Archaeopteryx, where it's basically the entire animal in a slab, The bones are dark brown, and then the matrix around it is sort of a tan to gray rock. And then there are some yellow patches. Mm. So at first you look at it and you're like, oh, those yellow patches are probably the feathers. But they're not. That's just sort of a discoloration of some of the rock. Mm -hmm. The feathers are also kind of yellow to yellow brown. So they're really hard to pick out from the other yellow patches. And you can tell how a paleontologist could easily miss the feathers and accidentally prep them away oh, yeah. when you're trying to get to the bones. Sounds like they didn't in this case, though. They didn't, but I'm sure it happens all the time. I mean, I would have made that mistake. I definitely wouldn't have noticed them. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm a fossil preparator, but <laughs> there are a couple of feathers that are very obvious on Wulong. Those are the tail feather pair. At first glance, I thought the tail feathers were actually just more of the tail vertebrae because they continue like in the exact same direction, mm-hmm. and they're pretty dark brown, just like the bones are. But when you look closer at them, you see that they sort of split. And so it's like a pair of feathers that looks really cool. So this new paper took a look at the melanosomes to see if they could determine the color of Wulong. And as a quick reminder, melanosomes are organelles that give color to our hair, dinosaur feathers, some fish scales, and lots of other soft tissues around the world. Different types of melanosomes produce different colors. Fortunately, some of the melanosomes are different shapes. So... Even if the only thing preserved about melanosomes in a fossil is their shape, we can make some educated guesses at their color. We don't actually need any chemistry of the melanosomes to make a guess. Mm -hmm. Some colors work better than others, but... (laughs) Yeah, I think you can tell black more easily than other colors. Yeah, you can, especially compared to gray. Gray is a really difficult one to tell. Obviously, microscopic level of detail for individual cells isn't preserved very often in the fossil record. So usually, even if we have these feathers preserved around the edge of a a fossil, you know, you're not going to be able to zoom in and see melanosomes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can, but a lot of times you can't. Fortunately, though, this Wulong does have that level of preservation, so we can see the melanosomes. Being one year old, this Wulong is, quote, the first unequivocal juvenile paravian for which aspects of the original color has been predicted, end quote. Ooh, that's a fun superlative. Yeah. (laughs) The first juvenile with colors Mm -hmm. determined or predicted. So that's important because a lot of animals change colors as they grow up. And we've wondered why dinosaurs might have been different colors as well as what colors they might have been. But getting that age factor into it is really interesting. So what these researchers did is they built on the work of previous scientists, as all good scientists do, and they combined existing models based on a total of 45 black, 35 brown, 35 gray, and 191 iridescent colored living species. Hmm. The reason there are so many more iridescent (laughs) samples than there are of the other colors is that iridescent colors can be made in multiple ways by animals. Mm -hmm. So in order to distinguish the different types of iridescence and actually just make sure that it was in fact iridescent and not just something close, they needed to include more samples. So they compared the melanosomes of Wulong to the melanosomes in their sample set to make best guesses at Wulong's color, or more specifically in this case, imprints of where the melanosomes used to be, sort of like microscopic footprints because the melanosomes themselves aren't there anymore. They just sort of lay, left little divots. Traces. Yeah, exactly. So in the end, they found that Wulong had iridescent feathers on its wings, legs, and that awesome pair of tail feathers that stuck far off the back of the tail. Pretty. Yeah, it looks really cool on the art. And then the rest of the body, they think, was basically gray. But again, gray is kind of a difficult one to tell. Mm-hmm. Iridescent is also kind of hard to tell which I think might be why they use the word prediction rather than like definitively reconstructed. Mm. <laughs> the paleo art gave it a tuft of iridescent feathers on its head and neck, which makes it look very cool. And they also gave it a mostly gray face, which gives it a little bit of contrast. 
but I want to point out that's purely a guess because unfortunately none of the feathers around the head and neck are preserved. Oh, but based on what is preserved, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, it, it does kind of make sense, but we really don't know. It's already unusual because they pointed out that most birds don't have like showy iridescent feathers mm -hmm. as their flight feathers, you know, like they're big what you think of when you think of a feather feathers, mm -hmm. not the little like fuzzy stuff near the body. So it, since it's already unusual, it's hard to color it based on a modern analog. But yeah, it could be. It's a, it's a reasonable guess. And you have to put something on its head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't want to just make it look like a bald vulture because we're like, well, we don't know if there were feathers there. So <laughs> let's assume there weren't any. Interestingly, they went a step farther than just reconstructing the color and made a conclusion about why Wulong had this pattern of feathers on its body. And what they decided is that Wulong used its iridescent feathers for communicating with other Wulongs. Interesting. Yeah. So in addition to that, since it was only one year old, they ruled out that it was trying to attract a mate mm -hmm. because it wasn't sexually mature. And therefore, Wulong was probably trying to signal other information than just like, look at me, which is what we always think of when we think of big showy dinosaur feathers like a peacock. Mm -hmm. So they didn't hazard a guess of what they might have been trying to communicate with their feathers. But a couple of things that we do see elsewhere in the animal kingdom or with modern birds is they could have been trying to signal to other birds about predators. Danger, danger. Yeah, exactly. Or communicating about food, whether they're foraging or hunting, mm -hmm. or they could have used them to establish pecking orders among you know, rivals, basically. Mm. But unfortunately, we can't tell which, if any of those they did from their colors because that's a pretty complicated thing. <laughs> Behavior is so hard to know from the fossil record. Yes, definitely. But that's amazing that we know about these iridescent feathers. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not familiar with iridescent feathers, they're sort of what a crow looks like or a raven. It's like usually black, but they sort of shimmer in a like bluish color when they're in light. They're pretty neat. And after a quick break, I'm going to talk about some dinosaur feathers found in amber. But first, let's hear from a couple sponsors. Okay, our next paper is all about dinosaur feathers in amber. And in addition to that, what might have been eating them. <laughs> but first, I want to jump back in time a little bit to give some context. So in 2004, Wappler et al., published a paper titled Scratching an Ancient Itch, an Eocene Bird Louse Fossil. <laughs> All right. I really enjoy that title, Scratching an Ancient Itch. Here's the lice. Yeah. So it was the first ever parasitic louse found in the fossil record. It was found in 44 million year old rock in Germany. This one wasn't in amber. And that's about 22 million years after dinosaurs went extinct. So mm. this isn't a non-avian dinosaur. Still technically a dinosaur, right. presumably, but not non-avian. A bird. Yeah. <laughs> the really cool thing about this find is that there were gut contents in the louse. Nice. It's pretty impressive that they found gut contents in a louse, which is like a couple millimeters long. Yeah. The gut contents included pieces of feather. So that confirmed that it was keratophagus aka keratin eating and feathers are made of keratin so keratophagus eating feathers eating keratin mm -hmm. the louse was almost certainly a parasite eating bird feathers directly off a bird Ooh. and that's based on similarities to modern lice that look just like it mm -hmm. that do that and it was probably an aquatic bird that it was eating the feathers off of based on comparisons to modern bird lice. I've never thought about lice eating feathers before. Yeah, it's pretty weird because in humans, we get three different types of lice. <laughs> they all prefer different parts of our bodies, but all three types of the lice on humans suck our blood. They're called sucking lice. <laughs> that's the category of lice that they're in. But this 44 million year old louse was a chewing louse mm. and they can eat feathers, hair, shed skin or other debris but they don't harm the animal as much i guess because they're not biting into the skin like the lice that we get so it's less annoying less itchy i think so yeah another side fun fact is that lice are very picky and usually specific to just one host species or in the case of the lice that affect humans one part of one species mm. 
So at the end of this paper in 2004, they made a prediction that a group of lice co-evolved with birds and may have started their feather eating in the Mesozoic on early feathered dinosaurs. Oh. So then flash forward to this year when Enrique Peñalvera et al. published on some Cretaceous beetles in PNAS. So and not exactly lice, but beetles. Mm-hmm. Similar in a way, though. Rather than a full adult insect with feather gut contents, they found molts of several larvae. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so since this is just sloughed off outer layers, there aren't any gut contents, unfortunately. Oh. And it sounds a lot less impressive at first, but these molted exoskeletons were found in pieces of amber, so they are very well preserved, and we can see a ton of detail. Mm-hmm. There are four pieces of amber. One of them is particularly good, but there are four total. And they were found in northeast Spain, and they're about 105 million years old. So in other words, like 60 million years (laughs) older than the previous study. Yeah, quite a bit older. Yeah. The larvae molts are surrounded with feather fragments, and the larvae themselves are at three different developmental stages. Or maybe I should say the molts indicate three different developmental stages. They look quite a bit like a modern group of keratophagus beetle. So it's not just lice that eat keratin and feathers, but beetles can also do it. They're probably a type of dermestid beetle, aka skin beetles, that are known from the Jurassic. And by that, I mean that skin beetles or dermestid beetles date all the way back to the Jurassic, like we have older finds already. Okay. I like these terms we've got. Keratin eating beetles or feather eating beetles, skin beetles. Yeah. I think the reason they're called skin beetles is because sometimes they eat skin. Mm. But I'm not positive about that. But that's dermestid. You can tell the derm part for skin. Dermestid beetles had never been found with feathers before in the fossil record. But today we find dermestid beetles as scavengers most of the time, and they feed on shed skin, hair, feathers, or basically anything else that they can digest and find laying around. They're often found in both mammal and bird nests, which makes sense because, say, they eat keratin, our hair is keratin, as are bird feathers. Mm -hmm. And they're really helpful for removing shed skin, hair, and feathers from those nests so it doesn't just build up and cause a big mess. They kind of remind me of those fish that eat the dead skin. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Off people's feet. (laughs) Yeah, they kind of clean up. Yeah, exactly. They're very helpful. But unfortunately for some people... They also like to eat natural fibers like wool, cotton, silk, etc., which can be a problem for people who like clothes without holes in them that live in an area with a lot of domestic beetles. Yeah, I'd say that's a lot of people like clothes without holes, uh, without unplanned holes. Yes, yeah. I know there's some clothes that have rips in them. <laughs> yeah, or just holes for a neck, I guess, and things like that. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought you were going with. A clo- a cloth without any holes is just a sheet that's not so useful. Mm. We've also seen dermestid beetles used to remove soft tissue from a roadkill owl once. Mm. Do you remember that? We were at a, touring a museum. Oh, yes. <laughs> that was cool. Yeah. So that's the type of beetle you use if you want to get the soft tissue yeah. off of something current because they'll gobble it up. They are effective. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, you you put the beetles in with your whatever and you're left with basically a, a nice cleaned up skeleton. Your whatever, usually an animal, like an owl. Yeah. (laughs) Whatever you want to see the skeleton of, I guess. The beetle molts in this case were surrounded by downy feathers, but we don't know if they were from a bird or a non-avian dinosaur for sure. Mm. There were four tiny copper lights in the amber, (laughs) although they didn't or couldn't analyze the composition of the tiny copper lights The beetles themselves were only a couple millimeters long, so the copper lights are really tiny. Oh, yeah. Like a tenth of a millimeter or less. That would be difficult to study. Yes. Although we've got some pretty powerful microscopes, so maybe. Yeah. Maybe a future study. Yeah. They're not sure whether to classify the beetles as beneficial to the dinosaurs or just sort of a neutral symbiote. The beetles don't have the defense structures, which are typically found on parasites that are sort of more hostile that live directly on the skin or in the feathers of a bird while it's flying around and stuff. So that's why they think that it probably lived in the nest. And also it looks like they were probably cleaning up a nest, gobbling up the feathers when tree sap got to them and later turned to amber, encasing them in there, or I should say 
encasing their molts. Yep. Preserving them for future studies. Yeah. Unbeknownst to them. <laughs> 105 million years later. Yeah. But speaking of molts, it wasn't just beetles molting. Dinosaurs also molted. Yes, they did. <laughs> There's a new paper published by Yosef Kiat and Jingmei O'Connor in Communications Biology. And basically most, if not all, modern birds molt at least once a year. They can do partial molts to change color or add insulation for different seasons. But what we're really focusing on is the annual molt that we think basically every bird does when they replace every single feather on their body with a new one. Hmm. There's only one documented case of a Mesozoic dinosaur molting outside of juveniles transitioning to adults, which isn't what we're focusing on. It's a single microraptor specimen where you can see a gap between two of the flight feathers. Oh, interesting. These researchers looked into why there are so few examples of molting dinosaurs, because that's a conundrum. We have hundreds <laughs> of microraptor and similar feathered dinosaurs, so you'd think you'd see molting more often. Mm -hmm. It's possible that these dinosaurs molted all of their feathers very quickly, so the odds of finding a molting dinosaur are very low, but they wanted to test that idea. And they looked at hundreds of examples of different birds in the Field Museum collection to see how many of them were missing any feathers. In other words, looked like they were molting. Mm -hmm. Mid-molt. Yeah. <laughs> With modern birds, usually it's just like one feather or two missing. So they don't look super obvious like they're missing feathers in all cases. You have to know what you're looking for. Definitely. Sometimes you can tell pretty clearly, like if it's one of their biggest feathers, but mm. usually it's a little more subtle. They found that birds that molt quickly with all of their feathers at once had less than 1% of the specimens in the field museum collections mid-molt. There could be a little bit of a bias here because museums tend to collect nice looking things. So they might err on the side of collecting birds that aren't in the middle of a molt, but there is a pretty big difference. Some of them were like 75% in mid-molt mm. <laughs> and other ones were less than 1%. So it, it might not be the case. Another approach could be to observe birds directly in the wild and see how long their molts take. And then you would just take a fraction of the days in the year that they're molting. And that would give you the probability of finding a molting individual if all other factors are even. So mm -hmm. like, say they molt for three days, there's 365 days in a year, it would be just under 1% probability of finding a molting one. But paleontologists like to work with museum collections. <laughs> so they took a different approach. Makes sense. You've got access to them. Yep. So then for the dinosaur side of things, they looked at 92 examples of feathered dinosaurs at the IVPP in Beijing. They found that 65 of them didn't have complete enough or clear enough feather preservation to determine if they were molting. But 26 of them were in such great shape that they were confident they could clearly tell whether or not they were molting. And in all 26 of those, they weren't molting. Mm. The only one that was molting was the previously known microraptor. Interesting. Yeah. So there are two possible explanations for why so few dinosaurs were mid-molt when they died. The one that we mentioned before, that basically the dinosaurs that we have fossils of molted all their feathers very quickly, like how mallards and some other water birds do now. Mm -hmm. And therefore the odds of finding one that's mid-molt is pretty remote. Or the other option is that they molted less frequently than modern birds. In other words, less than once a year, which would be weird to us because every bird does it. Yeah. But then again, birds are a pretty small subset of what dinosaurs were like. Mm -hmm. And they're also much more advanced down the evolutionary tree and have gone through some pinch points. So there isn't a lot of variety between how they molt in general. One piece of evidence in favor of the less often molting is that the feathers on some of these birds look pretty beat up. <laughs> in other words, like the dinosaurs have been wearing them for a really long time. Mm, they wore them out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They've got like threadbare feathers, Aww. essentially. Although, of course, it's hard to say if that damage happened while they were alive or if they happened after they were dead and, you know, starting to decay or something yeah. like that. Maybe they were scavenged or got weathered or all kinds of things. Yeah. They do have some similarities to how feathers weather on living birds. So that's their best guess. But it, yeah, it's hard to say for sure. The authors are leaning towards 
the less frequent molting explanation. That's because they think that dinosaurs that weren't really relying on their feathers for flight might not have needed to keep them in as pristine of condition. So they might have evolved that annual molt later once they were better flyers and really relying on those feathers to be in pristine condition. This also would have allowed these early dinosaurs that weren't so into like the perfect flight mechanics to save some energy because molting an entire body set of feathers takes quite a bit of energy and it's also can leave you a little bit vulnerable and has some other disadvantages. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep the feathers for longer and you don't need them to be pristine, that could have been good for them. Yeah, that makes sense. The other really interesting thing to think about here is how it relates to when we're talking about the evolution of flight and we talk about, oh, they needed asymmetrical feathers, they needed a rigid body, they needed these muscles, but it might also be the case that they needed to evolve an annual molt or like a more frequent update to those feathers because even if you have everything else perfect, if you have the most streamlined body, the strongest muscles, the you know the biggest arms the nicest wings everything like that but your feathers are all janky because you've been wearing them for like five years and they're all like stuck together and missing pieces Mm -hmm. (laughs) you're not going to be able to fly very well so it's another interesting factor in sort of a day-to-day behavior and like how they looked sort of aspect to the evolution of flight that nobody really talks about, yeah. you know, like how well they could maintain their feathers and how often they molted. It's very important to their ability to fly, but it's just not as obvious as something like an asymmetrical feather. It could be important in other ways too. Like you were saying with, if they use their feathers for communication, you want those feathers to be in good shape so that they can communicate clearly. Yeah. Or I guess, well, it kind of depends because maybe it's okay to have less pristine feathers if you're making like big movements Mm. you know they can tell whether or not they're in perfect shape and then if you're molting if you can't communicate as well Mm -hmm. (laughs) that could be a disadvantage so maybe you'd you'd stick onto the feathers longer it's a lot of balancing there to figure out what's best for them yeah so those are updates on dinosaur feather colors how they molted and what ate their feathers But clearly, there is much more to learn about feathers, and there will be ongoing studies in this area, and we'll keep updating as those studies come out. Yes. Next up, we'll get into our dinosaur of the day, but before that, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Cotopteryx, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. You say that differently than me, and I think better, because I sometimes say Mm. (laughs) caudipteryx. I don't know why I put the emphasis on the dip rather than the tear. (laughs) Yeah, when I see the PT together, I think, yep, tear, like pterosaur. Yep. (laughs) It was a basal oviraptor theropod that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Liaoning province in China in the Yixiang Formation. It looked very bird-like. It was covered in black downy feathers. It had long legs, a long neck short arms with feathers on it, tail feathers, and a rounded snout. So not exactly like a bird. Maybe if you saw it out of the corner of your eye, you'd think that's a weird looking bird. (laughs) It was peacock sized and estimated to be almost two foot five inches long to nearly three feet or about 0.7 to 0.9 meters long and weigh 11 pounds or five kilograms. And this is based on estimates from its femur. It's always amazing how large dinosaurs are for their weight. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Three feet long and 11 pounds. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But it was very light. It had delicate bones. It also had a box-like skull with large eyes, a short snout, with not many teeth. These teeth were small and weak. And it had a hallux, its first toe, that may have been partly reversed or backward facing and had body proportions like modern flightless birds. And it's pretty cool what you can learn from that first toe because based on it being partly reversed, it probably could perch like some modern birds. Yeah, that's the handy thing. You get the toes on the front of the perch and the one wrapping around the back and you get to get a sturdy grip. Yeah, although this one was only partly reversed. I don't know how sturdy of a grip it had. An okay grip. Yeah. (laughs) It was a decent percher maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Like early birds and the oviraptorid Heuania, it had a short third finger on its hands and it had short claws on its hands. 
The hand was longer than either the humerus or radius, the arm bones. That's pretty crazy that its hand is bigger than the most of the arm. Yeah. Kind of like a bat. Yeah. And it had long legs. It probably was a fast runner. It was thought to be secondarily flightless, so it evolved from animals that could fly, but it couldn't. It did have a highly developed wishbone or furcula like modern birds. Its wishbone was similar to Archaeopteryx, Confucius Ornus, and other non-avian theropods. That's crazy to think that it was secondarily flightless because just going back in time, it's like, oh yeah, in the Mesozoic, the dinosaurs hadn't evolved flight yet or they were just first developing it. And the fact that something developed flight and lost it before the end of the Mesozoic Mm -hmm. just seems so weird. Lots of things happening in yeah. the Mesozoic. <laughs> it just reminds you of how much time actually passed in the even just the Cretaceous alone. Yeah. In 2019, Aaron Dunroy and others found that the feathers of Cotopteryx were black and the tail feathers had a banding pattern. And its tail was short and stiff toward the tip or end, which is similar to birds and oviraptorosaurs. It was that stiff tip towards the end. It's basically a fan of feathers on the tail. Yeah, it's like a pyga style. It's a, similar to like if you look at a hawk or something, they have those fans of feathers. Mm-hmm. It has a similar sort of end to its tail. So they're like, oh, must have had a fan of feathers there. Yeah. It also had feathers with veins and barbs on its hands that were between almost six to eight inches or 15 to 20 centimeters long. And it had longer symmetrical feathers on its arms and tail, which was probably used for display or brooding because symmetrical feathers means it couldn't fly. Most likely. But also its proportions were not really bird size. And it had downy feathers that probably kept it warm. In 2018, Yasser Talarai and others experimented with a robot Cotopteryx with realistic wing proportions to test if the feathers on the wings helped it run faster. (laughs) You just like the idea of a robot dinosaur. Yeah. (laughs) Flapping robotic wings to get a little extra speed. Yeah. They found that if the wings were fixed and extended out, it would have only helped with small amounts of lift and drag, and the same with flapping while running. So based on the results, they found that its feathers were probably for display. It's possible the feathers helped with turning, like they do with ostriches. The next year, in 2019, Yasser Talarai and others re-examined how Cotopteryx used its feathers, and they used the robot again, and they estimated its max running speed to be about 8 meters per second. They found that while running, there would have been some forced vibrations that would have taught it to flap its wings. And then in 2022, Jing Shang Zhao and others, including Yasser Talarai, went back to the Cotopteryx robot, and they found more support that flapping evolved long before feathered dinosaurs could fly. They flapped while running on the ground. That's that grounds up versus trees down. So mm-hmm. their team grounds up at least for Cotopteryx. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting that while running, though, you, you've got these vibrations happening and it's like, oh, I'm going to flap my wings yeah. now. Well, it's <laughs> sort of like us, right? When we walk, it like gets our arms moving. Mm-hmm. You know, like you go with the opposite arm unless you start thinking about it too much and then it's hard to remember how your arms move. But <laughs> 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 yeah, so they probably had a natural sort of rhythm to their arms and then it might have gone more flap-like. Yeah. A Cotopteryx was probably omnivorous, though it's possible it was an herbivore possibly to eat insects and plants. Two individuals have been found with gastroliths. And Cotopteryx had a long neck with 10 vertebrae, although a later individual was found with 12 vertebrae. So based on the neck and gastroliths, they think, well, maybe it was herbivorous. There's two species of Cotopteryx, Cotopteryx zoi and Cotopteryx dongi. The type species is Cotopteryx zoi. The genus name, Cotopteryx, means tail feather. It was named by Ji Chiang and others in 1998. Several skeletons have been found. The first bones were found in 1997, so it was named shortly after it was found. The type specimen was close to mature when it died, and that's based on fusions and ossifications in the bones. The species name Zoi refers to, quote, Zhou Jiahua, vice premier of China and an avid supporter of the scientific work in Liaoning, end quote. The second species, Cotopteryx dongai, was named in 2000 by Zhang He Zhou and Xiaolin Wan. A nearly complete skeleton was found in 1998 with well-preserved wing feathers and nearly complete arms, hind limbs, and a pelvis, but no skull was found. Oh, wow. Yeah. I thought that the feathers were all just inferred. I didn't realize there was a specimen that actually had preserved. I guess I've only looked at the holotype. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Which is why they can tell the coloring and all these cool details. Yeah. 
So this was more articulated than the type species, and it was a large individual. Catopteryx dongai had a relatively long upper half of the pelvis compared to Catopteryx zoi, and a smaller sternum or middle part of the chest. And it had a short first toe or hallux that does face backwards, so it may have been able to perch. There were also skin impressions on the arms and hands, and, quote, the skin doubles the width of the digits when the animal was alive, end quote. So it wasn't shrink-wrapped. No. It's a meat on those fingers. <laughs> <laughs> the species name Dongai refers to Zhu Ming Dong, a distinguished Chinese dinosaur expert. Now, not all scientists think that Cotopteryx was an overraptor. Some scientists think it was a bird. Huh. I mean, it was very bird-like. Yeah. And because of Cotopteryx, there's been a lot of debate about how birds and dinosaurs are related. So in 1998, when Cotopteryx was named, there was a debate on the origin and evolution of early birds and whether they evolved from Silurosaurian theropods. Yeah, I suppose if it's a flightless bird, that makes it a bird. Mm -hmm. Even if it sort of looks like an oviraptor, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Then it would have to be a Silurosaurian, since we think those are the ones that became birds. Yeah, and Silurosaurus, they're a type of theropod, but they include a bunch of other groups like Compsognathids, Tyrannosaurs, or Nithomimosaurs, and Manoraptora includes birds. So when Cotopteryx was named, the author said that it represents, quote, stages in the evolution of birds from feathered, ground-living, bipedal dinosaurs, end quote. Oh, and really cool, there was a clump of feathers preserved on the chest. The authors named Cotopteryx based on two nearly complete, partially articulated skeletons with feather impressions on the arms, tail, and body. Again, that was found in 1997. Originally, they thought it was a manoraptor that's closer to birds than other dinosaurs, but there's been a lot of discussion since, and it's been compared with oviraptors and flightless birds. When it was described, Cotopteryx, it was thought to provide the first evidence of feathers in dinosaurs. But Zhou and Wang wrote, quote, this opinion, however, has been challenged by many paleontologists who suggest that Cotopteryx was probably a flightless bird, a Mesozoic kiwi. <laughs> <laughs> I think it looks more like a Mesozoic rhea or like a small Mesozoic emu. Oh, because of the long legs? Although kiwi birds have long legs. They do, but this one has big arms. Mm. Kiwis are like, their whole thing is they're a little fluff ball with no arms. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> In the paper naming Cotopteryx dongai, they interpreted Cotopteryx as a feathered dinosaur, but the author said, quote, we believe the debate on the dinosaurian or avian state of Cotopteryx and oviraptorids will continue, end quote. In 2000, Jones and others said Cotopteryx was a flightless bird based on comparing body proportions of flightless birds and non-avian theropods. And plus they had the specimen with a whole bunch of feather impressions to work with at that point. <laughs> yeah. In 2002, Teresa Marianska and others found Cotopteryx to be both an oviraptor and a bird. <laughs> it had feathers, and the oviraptors were found to brood eggs. In 2005, Gareth Dyke and Mark Norell found Cotopteryx to be a non-avian theropod and not a flightless bird. The proportions of the leg bones and center of mass are more similar to modern running or cursorial birds than non-avian theropods, which is why some scientists found it to be a flightless bird. Dyke and Norell argued that the conclusion that Cotopteryx was a flightless bird was based on the assumption that birds are not related to non-bird theropods. Lawrence Whitmer said, quote, The presence of unambiguous feathers in an unambiguously non-avian theropod has the rhetorical impact of an atomic bomb, <laughs> rendering any doubt about the theropod relationships of birds ludicrous, end quote. <laughs> That's quite the quote. <laughs> In 2000, Xiaoling Wang and others studied two new specimens of Cotopteryx, and each had skulls and were nearly completely articulated. So those are very good specimens. One they referred to Cotopteryx zoi, and the other was an indeterminate species. But they found lots of bird-like features, and yet still found it to be a feathered dinosaur. That's where they found the hallux that was at least partially reversed or backward, so the ancestor of Cotopteryx probably was able to hang out in trees. And the specimens that they studied were slightly smaller than the other specimens that had been found. But their leg to arm ratio was similar compared to the larger specimens. And that may mean that the arms developed earlier than the legs. So now we'll get into the part that ties into our mini season here. In 2021, Xiaoting Zheng and others studied cartilage of Cotopteryx. So Ooh. there we go. We've got soft tissue. More than just feathers. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, I guess, yeah, we did talk about feathers already. <laughs> <laughs> they demineralized the material and said it, quote, shows exquisite preservation, end quote. They found chondrocytes, which maintain cartilage, and one had a nucleus and, quote, fossilized threads of chromatin, end quote. That's a mix of DNA and proteins that form the chromosomes found in cells. And they said it, quote, retained some of their original chemistry, end quote. Hmm. They said it was the second example of fossilized chromatone threads. The first one was found in cartilage of the hadrosaur Hippacrosaurus. In the paper, they wrote, quote, these data show that some of the original nuclear biochemistry is preserved in its dinosaur cartilage material and further support the hypothesis that cartilage is very prone to nuclear fossilization and a perfect candidate to further understand DNA preservation in deep time, end quote. So it's a pretty big find. Understanding DNA preservation, those are strong words. I know. Because they I think the chemistry that they found is very distant from <laughs> DNA. It's like more simple molecules, but mm. yeah. Well, they said that the nuclei was thought to degrade quickly after death, but there are a lot of fossil tissues with preserved nuclei, quote, from permafrost, preserved Cenozoic mammals, Mesozoic dinosaurs, various Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and Paleozoic plants, and even embryo-like fossil cell clusters that are more than 600 million years old, end quote. But yeah, permafrost really helps preserve. 600 million years old is crazy. But I think what they're talking about there is that, like, we can see the shape of them, mm -hmm. not get DNA from them. <laughs> right. They also said that recent taphonomy experiments on plants and algae showed nuclei to be more stable and decay slower than previously thought. Cartilage found in mammals is, quote, one of the most durable and decay-resistant soft tissues of the body, end quote. And that's because it's shielded by surrounding tissues. There's no vascularization, blood vessels, which protects from microbial invasions. And there's a, quote, low cell density and its cells have an anaerobic metabolism, end quote, so no oxygen. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, oxygen is basically one of the biggest things that causes decay. And then after that, like you were saying, if there are blood vessels or something that can carry in bacteria or some kind of infection, or even just after the animal dies, keeps everything wet mm -hmm. and, you know, available for attack. You can see how this would last a really long time. Yeah. Plus, I don't think there's that much nutritional value in it, which is another benefit. Yeah. Chondrocytes have a delay when it comes to the self-destruction of cells and tissues. And this is known as autolysis. And that helps fossilize nuclei. And calcified cartilage seems to be even more decay resistant. So it's not surprising that fossilized calcified cartilage has, quote, exceptional cellular and nuclear preservation, regardless of the age of the fossil, end quote. So it may take a few weeks for chondrocytes to decay after an animal dies, which means in order for nuclear preservation in cartilage, the animal doesn't need to be buried immediately. They compared Cotopteryx to a chicken and found similarities. Based on the chemistry of the tissues and surrounding sediments of Cotopteryx, they found iron and other materials helped in the preservation, which we talked about in the first episode of this mini-series. And these other materials are common in the Jehol biota. And that's a place where we find tons of little bird-like dinosaurs with really well-preserved feathers, too. Yeah, although the iron kind of came later in the preservation process. They also found a cartilage cell nucleus, which has genetic material. And they said, quote, some of the original nuclear biochemistry is preserved in this dinosaur cartilage material. And then I'm going to share a long quote because I felt like I couldn't summarize it as well. <laughs> Maybe I can summarize it when you're done. <laughs> okay. They wrote, quote, it was recently proposed that even though DNA is apparently in a non-PCR amplifiable and non-sequenceable form in Mesozoic fossils, some of the original chemistry and molecules may still be preserved in the form of DNA fossilization products. This may explain why some dinosaur cells can still react with DNA stains, even though a DNA sequence has never been authenticated in any fossil much older than about 1.2 million years. Although the results presented here are preliminary chemical data, they still support the hypothesis concerning DNA fossilization products and reaffirm that much more efforts need to be made to investigate all the unanswered questions about DNA preservation in deep time, especially in fossilized cartilage, end quote. That's a fantastic quote. Yeah. But basically, I guess what they're saying is the DNA isn't in a complete state. 
And PCR, the whole thing that it does is it replicates entire DNA strains. So they're saying the PCR technology doesn't work because it's not in its original, you know, full DNA chunk, or at least full enough to be replicable. But there are little pieces of it which are recognizable to other molecules that just latch on to DNA Mm -hmm. and change the color when they hit it. Mm -hmm. So we know that there are a lot of pieces of DNA there. They're just too small to be useful with our current technology. Yeah. But that is kind of hopeful because I keep thinking like, well, maybe in the future, if we had some amazing technology, we could put all those little tiny pieces back together if we had enough samples and like some really powerful AI to figure out how it might fit together. But the pieces from what I've seen are really, really small, like fractions of a protein. Mm. And you need like multiple protein segments together to sort of recreate the DNA. Yeah. But the pieces exist. Yeah. The, there are pieces. There are pieces. <laughs> Who knows if they'll come together to form anything. Yeah. But. If there are enough pieces. Yeah. So that's a lot of soft tissue with Cotopteryx. And some other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Cotopteryx include the Tyrannosauroid Delong and the Dromaeosaur Cynornithosaurus. And talking about cartilage is actually going to be a really good segue to our third episode in this mini season, so stay tuned for that. And now for our fun fact, because I snagged the fun fact for this week. <laughs> you had too much to talk about. The fun fact is that mammals ate small dinosaurs. Usually we talk about the other way around. And yes, this does relate to soft tissues because soft tissues are the tastiest bits. (laughs) I see. (laughs) That's the tact you're taking. It is. (laughs) This was published in Scientific Reports by Gang Han and others, and it's open access, so you can check it out. It's really rare to find direct fossil evidence of mammals and dinosaurs interacting. Because like I've said, we usually talk about it the other way around, like, dinosaurs with mammals in their gut contents. This new fossil, though, it was found in China in the Yixiang Formation from about 125 million years ago, and it shows a small mammal, Repenomammus, and a Cetacosaurus, quote, locked in mortal combat. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, a Protoceratops and a Velociraptor, and now we've got a Cetacosaurus and a Repenomammus yep. locked together, too. <laughs> so it's most likely that the mammal was trying to eat the Cetacosaurus and then they died by volcano debris flow and they were buried in ash and mud. Yeah, don't mess with those beaky dinosaurs. They really bite back. <laughs> well, in this case, I'll, I'll get to that in a little later, but it seemed like the mammal was winning. Oh. So Repenomammus was a possum to badger sized mammal. It looked kind of like a badger. This particular one weighed about 7.5 pounds, almost three and a half kilograms. But it attacked a dinosaur about three times its size because <laughs> uh, this Cetacosaurus weighed almost 23 pounds or almost 10 kilograms. Yeah, we were just talking about how dinosaurs like are bigger than their weight makes them seem. Mm-hmm. Like compared to a mammal, like a 23 pound mammal and a 23 pound dinosaur, usually the dinosaur is a lot bigger and more ferocious. So then this is just like even more of a lopsided, why would you attack yeah. something that big? It's a really cool fossil. The Cetacosaurus skeleton is complete. It's lying on its belly with its hind limbs folded on either side of its body. They think it's at least six and a half years old, maybe closer to 10 years old when it died. And the Repenomammus is on top of the left side of the Cetacosaurus, and its skeleton is nearly complete. It's only missing part of the tail. Its left hand or paw is gripping the lower jaw of Cetacosaurus, but its left leg is trapped under the Cetacosaurus's folded left leg. But its foot is gripping the dinosaur's left shin. They're very interlocked in battle. It yes. Sounds like. It seems like it died, the mammal died while biting into the dinosaur's ribs. The two ribs seem to be broken, but that's hard to tell if that's from the mammal or just the way that it was buried and fossilized. Wow, so it could have been a very hard bite. Yeah. And the mammal, they think, was probably a subadult. There was a whole section of the paper on why the skeleton is real and not forged, <laughs> because some people are questioning if the find is real or if it is, if it actually shows predation or if it shows the mammal scavenging. I think we'll have to wait and see if there's future peer-reviewed papers on this. For now, the author said that the way the two skeletons are intertwined shows that they were probably buried where they died and that it happened quickly. 
They also said that the way the mammal is biting and clutching and on top of the Cetacosaurus shows it was, quote, clearly the aggressor. They said that it's not immediately obvious that the mammal is attacking and it could look like it's scavenging. It would make it easier to bite the ribs if the dinosaur was already dead. But they also said there's three things that gave it away. One, Cetacosaurus didn't have teeth marks on it, quote, commonly left by carnivorous mammals while scavenging, end quote. Two, it seems unlikely that they'd be so entangled if Cetacosaurus was already dead. And three, the mammal could have just taken bites of the dinosaur while on the ground, but instead it was on top of the dinosaur. So instead, it seems the mammal was attacking Cetacosaurus and then they were suddenly entombed, and that helps explain why the mammal's left foot got stuck under the Cetacosaurus' left leg when it collapsed to the ground. So it sounds like they're a little bit less intertwined than the fighting dinosaurs because it's not like one has got a foot in and the other one's biting. The Cetacosaurus isn't really... Fighting back. Yeah. No, they're saying that the mammal being on top looks like it's subduing its weakened prey. Oh, jeez. And some modern mammals are known to go after prey much larger than them. Like wolverines apparently sometimes hunt moose, caribou, and sheep. Oh, wow. Weasels also sometimes attack animals much larger than themselves. It also makes sense for why the Cetacosaurus looks like it gave up. African wild dogs, spotted hyenas, and jackals sometimes have an initial struggle with prey, and then the prey, quote, may ultimately give up on self-defense, opting instead to passively lay down in a state of exhaustion and deep shock. Oh, quote. that's kind of sad. Yeah, it could have been the same for the Cetacosaurus. That sounds like quite a battle. Yes, um... I mean, what a way to end, but I guess on the bright side, the Cetacosaurus didn't suffer long because they got buried quickly. Yeah, that's true. I know we're all about the dinosaurs here, but also go mammals. Yeah, rooting for the home team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. If you want to learn more about dinosaur feathers, then check out our episode 390, How Dinosaurs Evolve Flight. Garrett went down some Erichter Dromaeus burrows for that one. And stay tuned for next week's episode. It's the third and last in our mini-series, and we'll be talking about soft tissue for breathing and tendons, and I believe a little bit about cartilage. And if you like listening to I Know Dino, please share with a friend. That really helps us out. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.